Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, before we do get started, I do want to let you know that the program uh, the program is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. And you can support the program on a one-time basis at support.greatdetectives.net or on a monthly basis at patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now we uh, embark on the first of three different radio series uh, featuring the character of Michael Shane. This is a character whose portrayal varies radically from the books, to the movies, to the radio series, and the television. Michael Shane made his first appearance in print in 1939 in Dividend on Death. The book was written by Davis uh, Dresser under the pseudonym Brett Alliday. Dresser had inspiration for Michael Shane when he was in a bar in Mexico. In the bar, a fight broke out. A fearsome row, people um, throwing punches and breaking things. This guy, a red-haired guy, just sat at his table quietly uh, drinking his cognac. And the fight carried on for a little while. And then he got up and just started uh, knocking people out with one punch. And then he stumbled into the guy in another bar. Uh, wanted to talk with him, get to know him a bit. And then two men uh, came in and escorted the uh, gentleman away. And he had a very nervous look about him. And that character, that gentleman, really uh, gave Davis Dresser some ideas. So he created Michael Shane in this very hard-boiled mode. And the books were popular, so Hollywood came calling. However, what the Hollywood often did with successful books is they would take the detective's name, maybe a couple details, and they would change it. Uh, whatever uh, suited them in order to fit the actor playing the role. In this case, uh, Lloyd Nolan, who was just not that sort of uh, character. So, and particularly this was in the wake of the Thin Man movies and other uh, detective comedy stories. The movies had a much lighter touch about them. And the, this first radio show really does follow that uh, uh, general uh, tendency. And there are other changes as well. The Michael Shane books are set in Miami. That's his hometown. However, uh, a city that radio writers knew well and was the subject of other popular detective uh, series was San Francisco. And so these stories are set in San Francisco. They starred Wally Mayer, who... Uh, some listeners may remember as Sergeant Greb from the lineup. And those who have been with us a bit longer will remember from Lieutenant Riley from Let George Do It. Well, we won't go into too much more about our star since he's not actually in this episode. Yes, the earliest episode we have of Michael Shane has uh, Wally Mayer in the hospital and Edmund McDonald uh, playing the lead role. So here from April the 1945, is the Newton murder case. Due to the illness of Wally Mayer, the part of Mike Shane will be played tonight by Edmund McDonald in The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. It's a bright and sunny San Francisco afternoon. The sort of day you want to close up your office, say to heck with work, and go over the hill. Right now, Mike Shane and Phyllis Knight have closed their office and gone over the bay. But they can't say to heck with work. In fact, work is calling them to the Oakland Railroad Terminal. As they enter the depot, Phyllis looks at her wristwatch. Twenty past three. Mike, do you realize that train is five whole hours late? Uh, I ought to. This makes our third trip across the bay to meet it. You know, watch out for these swinging doors. Yeah. From Chicago, Des Moines, Denver, Salt Lake City, on track 
too. Oh, it's in, all right. Here comes the red cast with the bags. Hey, I'd still like to know why we had to come clear over here to the train to welcome Mr. Frank Hewitt Newton back to his own town. I wouldn't know it in a minute, Angel. Fifteen-word telegram can't say much more than meet me at the depot, Pioneer Limited. Plus that little business about a package he's sending you, Air Express. Uh-huh. Something's wrong, and I guess he wants fast action on it. Yeah. Hey, there he is. Where? Where? Right ahead of us. Those two men and that red-headed gal. Yeah. Oh, uh, glad to see you, Mr. Newton. Oh, uh, uh, Mr. Newton. Hey, uh, Mr. Newton. Uh, it's me, Mike Shane. But, uh, well, I'll just look right through us. Well, maybe he didn't hear us. Come on, we'll catch him at the taxi stand. Okay. Excuse me. 40,000 people in our way. Oh, hey, oh, excuse me, sir. But, uh, this way, Phil. Hurry, come on. Yeah. They're outside already, Mike. There, there he is. Get into that sedan with the others. Well, run for it, Mike. Run! Oh, Mr. Newton! Mr. Newton! Mr. Newton! Oh, save your lungs. Save your lungs, Mike. He's gone. Oh, for the love of... You know, he's got a real cute sense of humor, hasn't he? Three trips across the bay to glad-hand a guy, and he gives you the glassy stare. Yeah. Maybe it ain't from humor. Let's head back to the office. I want to do some phoning. Hello. This is Mike Shane calling. Mr. Newton in? No, no. He got back a half an hour ago. He wired me to meet him at the Oakland Depot, but something went wrong. Oh, you're Mrs. Newton? Yeah, that's right. Mike Shane, the detective. I don't know. I got his telegram from Reno telling me to meet him at the train. Yeah, yeah, it was sent from Reno. Oh, well, if I knew, I'd tell you, Mrs. Newton. You, you haven't phoned me. Oh, well, well, thanks a lot. Goodbye. Oh, so friend husband didn't tell the missus he was arriving home today. Mm, guess not. She thought he was still in Chicago. Awfully curious why he was hiring Mike Shane, the detective. That makes three of us. Where's that telegram? I want to read it again. Oh, oh here, on the desk. Thanks. Uh -huh. Reno, 11.10 p.m., sending package, Air Express, hold for me, stop. Meet me, Oakland Depot, tomorrow, Pioneer Limited, Frank Hewitt Newton. Well, he must have gotten off the train to send the mysterious package. But why? To make little girls ask big questions. Smart. So far, the score's double zero. No package, no client. I'll get it. Mike Shane speaking. Mr. Newton. Say, what went wrong? We went over to the depot. We, we saw you. hollered at you. Chased after you. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, well, all right. But but it seemed funny. Well, no, it hasn't. Where? Fairfax Hotel. Well, sure, if it comes before we close the office. Uh, room 911. Yeah, okay. But would you not mind telling me what it's all about? Hello? Hello, Mr. Newton. Hello? Hello? Oh, he hung up on me. Well, did he tell you why he gave us the fast oh, run around? Oh, he says he'll explain later. He wants me to bring the express package to him at the Fairfax Hotel when it comes. Well, it sounds to me like he's dodging the sheriff or bill collectors. Well, it sounds pretty worried to me. He's dodging something or... But what? Or Who? <laughs> Uh, you're Mr. Shane? That's right. Something we can do for you? I'm Mrs. Frank Newton. Oh. We talked on the phone. Won't you have a chair, Mrs. Newton? I've come here, Mr. Shane, to find out exactly why my husband hired you. I'm afraid you know as much about it as I do, Mrs. Newton. In other words, you won't tell. It's about me. Mr. Shane isn't in the habit of lying, Mrs. Newton. We do not know. We think it has something to do with a package which your husband sent to us. A package? Yes, an air express from Reno. Uh, he phoned a few minutes ago from the Fairfax Hotel. I'm to deliver it to him there. <laughs> That's all I know. Fairfax Hotel? Hm. Well, I'll see about that right now. Well, that lady better watch her blood pressure. Mm. This is a divorce case. I'm getting out of it. Yet somehow it doesn't smell like one. Hey. Hey, Mike. Now, where are you going? Fairfax Hotel. I'm going to find out what this hoopla is all about. I'll see you later. Oh, fine. Fine. Now, all I got to do is sit here and just go crazy. I write letters, which is worse. Oh, dear. 
Hi there, fellas. Fellas. If you want to see Mike, Inspector, you missed him by 15 seconds. Huh. You must have gone down the other hole. You mind if I sit down? Just make yourself comfortable. Thanks. You're just in time to see me go nuts. Huh? Batty. Telegrams, trains late, phone calls, people tearing in and out. Oh, there, you see? See what yeah. I tell you, see? Air Express for Mr. Michael Shane. Air... This is it. It's come. Let me see uh, it. Uh, take it easy, lady. I just want you to sign. Yeah, sure, sure. The receipt. I'll sign it. Here. Here. Like that? Uh, thanks. You're welcome, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Phil, what's gotten into you? Where's the package? What's the package? What is it's it all about? It's no bigger than a small book. It doesn't even weigh as much. But this is the dear little darling that's got a skagger. Will you let me have that again? Third day, we got a telegram. Sending you package, Air Express. Hold for me. He walked right past us at the train. Wants it delivered to the hotel. Wife says it's hers. And Faraday, have you got an aspirin? Oh. Relax me, gal. I'll get it. Mike Shane's office. Huh? Oh, no. Where? Market and Geary. Right away. Faraday, what's the matter? What's wrong? Phil. What? What is it? Mike's been hurt. Bad. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike Shane and his assistant Phyllis in their adventures. Regular lubrication for your car is, of course, most important. But proper lubrication is even more so. If your car is carelessly or hurriedly greased, important fittings may be missed or left dry. That is why Union Oil Stop Wear Lubrication means extra insurance against mechanical wear and depreciation. Stop Wear Lubrication jobs are a matter of pride with the Union Oil Minutemen. Only the finest high-quality greases are used. Each fitting is carefully and thoroughly lubricated according to the manufacturer's specifications. While your car is on the hoist... The Minutemen inspect out-of-sight points and check them for danger signs. Stop wear lubrication is so accurate and scientific that you receive a written guarantee with each job, which is definite proof of reliable service. Your car will roll smoother, handle easier, stand up better with stop wear lubrication. So, ladies and gentlemen, for guaranteed, reliable lubrication, ask your Union Oil Minuteman for stop wear. Stop wear is an exclusive process available only at Union Oil Minuteman stations. Phyllis and Inspector Faraday have reached the intersection of Market and Geary Streets where Mike was reported badly hurt. I'm scared. I'm scared, Faraday. I'm just scared sick. If Mike is hurt so bad that he... I know what you mean, but where is he? There's no crowd, no ambulance. Well, maybe they've taken him to the hospital. Perhaps. Let's ask that traffic officer over there. He's just got to be all right. He's the best boss, the best guy who ever lived. Officer. Officer. Yes, sir? Did the ambulance take the man who was injured here a few minutes ago? What man? Mike Shane, my boss, the best guy who... He was run over. Not on my corner. Ain't been even a dented fender around here all day. But they said Market and Geary, they said he... They said... Oh. Yeah. A phony call. Somebody wanted you out of your office. Oh, I have been a dope. They wanted that package. We've got to get back, Faraday. Too late now. I've lost it. Mike was to deliver it to the Fairfax Hotel. What'll he do to me? I'm curious. Let's pick him up at the hotel and find out. What are you two doing here? Looking for Mike Shane, Lothario of the hotel lobby. Oh, golly, Mike, it's good to see you alive and whole. (laughs) Huh? Mike, the Air Express came, and then we got a phone call saying you were hurt and to come quick, and we ran out, and and, uh, I forgot the package. It's it's stolen. Holy, uh, we're the oldest trick in a book. Now what'll I tell Newton? Nothing, just hand him the package. Here it is. Faraday? In your pocket? Yeah, sure. I grabbed it when we tore out. You knew it was a fake call and you let me go on worrying. <laughs> oh. I'd like to know who made that call. It was a woman's voice. Mrs. Newton. She tried to get the package before. Maybe. I talked to Mr. Tootin on the lobby phone here. He said he'd be down in a minute. Did he tell you what this hide-and-seek is all about? No. I think he was holding a conference in his room. One of the men we saw him with him at the depot got out of the elevator. Then you're waiting for Newton now. Yeah, if he ever goes down. Well, let's go up to his room and talk to him. Yeah, I'd like to know what's on the fire myself. I suppose that... Okay, 
It's from 9-11. Well, come on, Mike. The elevators are this way. Yes, and so is Mrs. Newton. She just stepped out of one. Yeah. Uh-oh, let's not tangle with her again. Amen. Yeah, she's going through that arcade. All right, kids. Let's make an end run for it. <laughs> Here it is, Mike. Number 911. Huh? Yeah. The key is on the outside of the door. I will be so glad when we get rid of this package. It's hexed. Mm. Uh, no answer. Suppose we might stick our heads inside? Go ahead. I've got the authority. Uh, Mr. Newton. Uh, Mr. Newton, it's uh, Mike Shane. Well, he must have gone downstairs. Hey, what's that noise? Come on, let's find out. See anybody? Uh oh. <gasps> On the sofa. Yeah. Mike, is that. Is he. Useless question, don't you think? Pillow over his face. Or oh, what used to be a pillow, it's blown inside out. Stuck the gun into the pillow and used it as a silencer. Is that your man, Newton? Must be. Yeah. Yeah, I can still recognize him. Yeah, but this man's dead and we heard sounds. Here he is. Where? Tied up with bed sheets and gagged. Slugged a couple of times, too. Here, give me a hand, Mike. Hey, you bet. Hey. Hey, I know him. This is one of the guys who came out of the depot with Newton. Yeah, he's not tied very tight. Let's get that gag out of his mouth. Oh, thank heavens. I was choking. Can you stand up? I, I think so. Oof. Dizzy. You hit me so hard. Who are you? Carl Stanton. Frank's business partner. You, uh, were, Mr. Stanton. You mean... Then he... He he did it? Very thoroughly. You know who did it? There were two of them. A man and a woman. She called him George. That's it, Mike. The other two who were with Newton at the depot. Yes. Frank wired me to meet him there. They were with him. Had guns and said they'd kill us if we called for help. That explains why Newton gave us the brush off at the station. We didn't dare make a sign. They forced Frank to come to the hotel and get this room. They made him phone a detective. I guess it was you, sir. Uh, bring the necklace here. You mean there, there's jewelry inside his package? A diamond necklace. Cost Frank $42,000. Ooh. And he sent it to me because he knew these two were after it. Oh, confound it. They've cut the phone wires. I have to go downstairs to call headquarters. Just a minute, Faraday. Let's get a description of the two so you can broadcast an alarm. Don't worry, I intend to. Now, look, give us the whole story while you're about it, Mr. Stanton. Well... Frank bought the necklace in Chicago for his wife. These people got on the train there, he said. They became so friendly, got suspicious. He sneaked off the train at Reno and shipped the necklace to Mr. Shane. Well, somehow they must have figured out the trick. Well, they found the Air Express receipt in Frank's wallet. So they made him come to the hotel and then phoned the detective. The red-headed girl said she was going downstairs to the drugstore. But she didn't come back, and the other one got awfully excited. He said she was double-crossing him. Well, she made that phony call. She went to our building, watched for the express truck, and then tricked us, huh? Probably. Go on, Mr. Stanton. Well, this fellow lost his head. Said he'd blow our brains out if we didn't give him money. We were to call a messenger here to the room with all our company cash. I tried to sneak the gun away from him, and... Well, that's the last I knew. Uh Uh-huh. He slugged you, tied you up, then killed Newton. He really went haywire. I'll get it. I'll answer it. Is Mrs. Newton in? Well, uh, I... come on in. Well, I, I didn't expect to find so many. Pe- Good Lord, Frank! Yeah, murdered. Couple of jewel thieves. What did you want? Why, uh, I, uh, I was to meet Mrs. Newton here. What for? I, uh, I'm her attorney, Warren Wilson. We're going to discuss Edna's divorce and property settlement with, uh, with him. Looking out for her interests very carefully, aren't you, Wilson? Somebody has to. The way you're milking the company. That's a lie. If anybody was milking it, it was Frank. $42,000 for a string of diamonds. You mean the company bought the necklace? It did. Frank phoned me from Chicago for the money. I told him it would take all our cash we had in the bank. Just a minute. Mr. Wilson, is this the first time you've been to this room? Certainly. Hmm. We found the key on the outside of the door. Why, anybody could unlock it and come in. Right. What about Mrs. Newton? We saw her come out of the elevator. Yeah, but, Mike, Mr. Stanton didn't mention her. Of course, he was unconscious. Wouldn't know. Phil, 
You looked up Newton's house phone. You remember the street number? Yeah, yeah. Let's get going. I want to swap one diamond necklace for one piece of information. Send a cop up to the room, will you, Mike? I'm going down to headquarters and broadcast a pickup for the Chicago page. Okay, but don't talk the newspapers yet or you'll be sorry. What do you wish to see me about, Mr. Shane? The Air Express package just came, Mrs. Newton. We understand it's for you. May I have it, please? Certainly. Here you are. Thank you. Your, uh, your eyes are red, Mrs. Newton. Is there something wrong? Why, uh, no, I, I'm just upset. I'm getting a divorce. Warren Wilson is your attorney, I believe. Oh, I suppose Frank has set you on his trail. Gentleman seems very interested in protecting your financial interests. I don't believe that concerns you. Excuse me. Uh, by the way, I saw you in the lobby of the Fairfax Hotel a while ago. Did you uh, talk over the divorce with your husband? I... yes. How did he take it? Mr. Shane, if you came here to pry into my private affairs... I came I... here, Mrs. Newton, to tell you that your husband is dead. He's dead? Who did it? I didn't say he was murdered. Oh, oh no. Uh, no, of course not. I, I just assumed from the way you spoke... As a matter of fact, he was shot to death. Yes, they're looking for the killers right now. Two jewel thieves followed Mr. Newton from Chicago. Oh, well, then it was for this. This is my anniversary present. That's a pretty costly one for a man who was going to leave you. Well, if I'd only known. We were in Chicago, and I, I told Frank I wanted some diamonds for our 15th anniversary. He said no, and... We quarreled, and, and I came home without him. This attorney, Warren Wilson, he wanted you to get a divorce, didn't he? Well, he said it was my only protection, that Frank and Carl Stanton were robbing the company, and Warren was worried about my property. Which, of course, he would be glad to protect uh, if he married you. Oh, never. I told him so. I respect him as an attorney, but as a man, a husband, no. He's probably heard that women change their minds. That would pay off even as executor of your husband's estate. You mean Warren might have... Oh, no, he couldn't be smart enough to use a pillow. Mike. No, I guess he wouldn't, Mrs. Newton. In fact, it's pretty ingenious for a woman. Uh, I didn't do it. I, I swear I didn't. I, I, I opened the door and Frank was on the couch and I just turned and ran. and I, I didn't know what to do. I, I was afraid to tell anybody... What would the police say? Oh, that's easy to find out, Mrs. Newton. Put on your hat and coat and we'll go down to headquarters. Powderfield, turn it up, will you? Repeating, pick up man and woman, George Highland, alias Slip Doyle, age 36, height 5 feet 9, weight 155, blonde hair, woman Gwen Evans, alias Clara Bloomberg, age 26, 28, height 5 feet 3, weight 105, red hair, warning, they are killers, they are killers. Well, Faraday got a real description of the two. Stanton must have identified them from police uh, photographs. Well, then what's the sense of dragging me in? They're the ones that they killed Frank. Now, did they, Mrs. Newton? I wouldn't be known. Mike, that coupe behind us. Yeah? I saw it park across the street when we rang Mrs. Newton's doorbell. You sure of it? I'm positive. Okay, I'll turn at this corner and see what happens. Yeah, it's still behind us, Mike. It went so dark I could see who's driving. Wait a minute, the street lamp. That... Yeah. I caught it in the rear vision. His pal, Georgie, alias Slip Joy. Oh, the killer! He's alone. He's alone in the car. Oh, oh, he's after my necklace. He's after me. He's after all three of us. Mike, head for a police station. Save our necks and lose? Uh-uh. We're heading for the office of Shane Detective Agency. Mike, you're plain crazy. Maybe. We'll decide that after the trap is set. Oh, fine. If we're still alive to decide anything. <laughs> We'll return to Mike and Phyllis in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, the entire weight of your automobile rides directly on the wheel bearings. 
Now, wheel bearings are round, must revolve rapidly, and yet support the heavy weight of the car. Because of this concentrated pressure, and because they are also liable to damage from brake dust, grit, and water, the front wheel bearings need the best possible lubrication. Failure to keep these bearings properly lubricated may result in expensive repairs requiring parts now hard to get. Your neighborhood Union Oil Minute Man knows this. That's why he takes such pains to do a thorough job of lubricating the front wheel bearings. First, he washes out all the old grease and dirt with solvents. Then the bearings and races are individually cleaned until they are dry and shiny. Finally, the clean, polished bearings are replaced in the races and greased with special equipment to make certain that every surface is snugly sealed in a thick coating of Union Oil wheel bearing grease. Then your front wheels are all set for months of well-lubricated, easy rolling. The cost for the entire service of your front wheel bearing assembly is nominal. So for safer, easier driving, just stop in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and take advantage of Union Oil's front wheel bearing service. Thank you. Mike thinks he has a plan to capture the murderer who is trailing him. With Phyllis and Mrs. Newton, he is just entering his office. Turn on the lights, Phil. Yeah. Mike, this room, it's been ransacked. Sure. Except Doyle's red-headed girlfriend, that fake phone call you got, remember? Well, he'll be here any second, Mr. Shane, by the next elevator. Phil, you get into your office. Do exactly as I told you. Okay, all right, but this better work good. And lock your door from the other side. Oh, Mr. Shane, the man's desperate. He'll kill us, I know. I don't think so. If he sees I'm a mom, I'm not. So is my husband. Good evening. Do you always enter with your hat on and a gun in your hand? I saw three of you get out of the car. Where's the girl? Bill? Oh, uh, she went down the hall. Uh, she went down the hall. Maybe. Or maybe she's in the next room. Locked. You. Oh, uh, why? Hand over the necklace. Well, I haven't got it. Really, I haven't. Uh, uh, Mr. Shane, he... Oh, he's got it. All right, Shane. <laughs> Sorry. I'm fresh out of diamonds, too. Wasting your time, pal. No diamonds in that desk. Your red-headed valentine gave this place the frisk hours ago. Oh, the dirty little double-crosser. You've got the necklace here somewhere. I saw you go into that house with the package and come out again with it. Grandma, what big eyes you've got. I'll give you ten seconds. I'd hate to spoil your nice carpet with a lot of blood. Oh, don't, don't. Well, I can have the carpet clean. And uh, I'll have to unless you hand me your gun right now. What are you giving me? You've got a good pair of eyes, chum, but you don't raise them high enough. Next time you test a locked door, look up at the transom. Huh? It's open. And a gun's sticking right through at it. And it's aimed right at your heart, mister. <laughs> Bad news for your kids. I just talked with ballistics. What do they say? Slip Doyle's gun hasn't been fired for some time. What did I tell you? I didn't do it. Well, maybe he used the girl's gun. We'll have to wait on that. They just picked her up over in Oakland. He might have used another gun. We know he threatened to kill Newton. Well, I, I was just bluffing. He and that other guy knew it. He said I'd be scared of the noise. I told him there wouldn't be any. I'd stuff a pillow in his face and shove the gun into it, but I didn't kill him. No, you just got bored with the whole thing. You walked out leaving two guys to turn in the alarm. Oh, no, I locked them in. That's the catch. The key was on the outside of the door. Anybody could walk in and do the job. Okay, then I'd pick Newton's wife. She's in the next room with Stanton and that attorney, isn't she? Yeah, let's have a talk with him. And you're coming too, Slip. Well, all cleared up. Can we go now? Not yet. We're not dead sure this is the killer. What? But you all said he was. You might have that honor, Mrs. Newton. You tried to cover up the fact that you were in that hotel room. But I explained that. Maybe. But you sure had blood in your eye when you left our office this afternoon. Preposterous. It's this jewel thief, undoubtedly. Well, perhaps an attorney who tried to get Mrs. Newton away from her husband. I was protecting her from Frank and Carl. They were stripping the business. How very noble of you, Mr. Wilson. However, I agree, it must have been this thief. Oh, you're all trying to frame me. Now, wait a minute. Nobody's trying to frame you. 
You said you threatened to kill Newton. Now he's dead. You said you were going to fire your gun through that pillar. That's how we found it, the exact way. Say that again, Faraday. Huh? Never mind. Have we been slow? Remember when you and Phil found me in the lobby? I said I saw the Chicago guy going out of the lobby? Yeah, sure. That was before I talked to Frank Newton on the desk phone. Well, then then Newton was still alive when Slip Doyle left the hotel. I told you so. Slip Doyle made the threats. He told exactly how he'd kill Newton, but he didn't follow through. There was one other person, the only other one in the room, to hear the threat and to carry it out in detail. Carl Stanton. Right. Like a cinch. The jewel thief was a perfect fall guy. No, no, you're wrong. I told you Carl was stealing from the company. With Newton out of the way, he could lay all the blame on his partner. So the two crooks had a falling out. That's why Stanton was tied up so sloppy. He did it himself. Okay, I'll send a man to the hotel to find his gun. That'll cinch you. It's cinched right now. We've got the motive. We've got Doyle's testimony. We've got our own. You'll never convict me. I'll kill myself. I don't think you will, Mr. Stanton. They tell me the suicide rate in the county jail is very low. You, um, you don't have to see me to my door, Mike. I'm not afraid of the dark anymore. Please, Angel, allow me one little touch of Irish gallantry. Oh, <laughs> all right. Here we are. If I can just find my keys. Phil. Faraday told me how busted up you were when you thought I was injured. The best boss, the best guy who ever lived. Oh, well, uh, Faraday is an old gossip. You know better than to believe his stories. Oh, jeepers, these keys are here somewhere. If, if I had been injured, uh, what would you have done? Oh, I, I'd come down to the hospital and kiss you, make you well. You were, huh? Kiss me, huh? Mm-hmm. Oh, here, here are my keys. Well, um... Good night, Mike. Oh! What? What's the matter? What's wrong? Oh, I'm hurt. I just bit my lip. Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Ed McDonald substituted for Wally Mayer, whose appearance was prevented by illness. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Holliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. This is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site. We stream live OTR Westerns 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, along with putting out podcasts of old-time radio westerns. Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old-Time Radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. Well, a very solid beginning. I also have to say I really like the um, sound quality on these recordings. And this is overall just a very fun, engaging, a traditional story. And again, you see the style that is adopted here. Now, the next series, and this is probably the one that more of you are going to be familiar with or have heard is uh, Jeff Chandler's uh, New Adventures of Michael Shane. And so that's a real contrast in style. But overall, this was just a very entertaining story. Love Kathy Lewis in that. We'll have to talk about her more in depth. While Edmund McDonald isn't the uh, regular star of the program, uh, listeners of Great Detectives of Old Time Radio who have been with us from the beginning will remember him. Or uh, he was... Uh, 
in the very first episode of the series, episode triple uh, zero one. He played Lieutenant Kling on Box 13, Dan Holliday's uh, police foil. And so here it's nice to hear him in a bit of a lead role. All right, well, that will do it for today. But this isn't the only premiere this week. Tomorrow, join us for Hearthstone of the Death Squad. And then next Monday, another episode of Michael Shane Private Detective. In the meantime, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Det